last week at this time, I was in Jerusalem, sitting in a park, Gan Hapa'amon, towards the middle of the city, towards the middle of the beating heart of our people. I was surrounded by, by friends, friends that I made mostly in my 20s, in what I know for our bat mitzvah and our confirmands will be really transformative years in their lives, because study after study says that the years leading into the end of your high school experience, beginning of your university experience, and the first few years after university really set the course of what it means to live a Jewish life for you. In this group of friends, there were a few rabbis now, a few rabbinical students, congregational teachers, lay leaders, board members of some of the movements of the reform movements in countries around the world and liberal movements, Zionist leaders that represent us to the WZO, the World Zionist Congress and the World Zionist Organization. And there was something remarkable about this group. This is a rarity in Jewish communal life that amongst this group of friends, I actually raised the average age of the gathering. <laughs> One of the topics which came up during our, our chat in the park on the Shabbat morning afternoon was the question of who are going to be the next leaders for our movement in the future? Who are going to take the place of these 20 and 30 year olds who are already looking into the future for us and for our movement? And part of that question was the question of how we educate, of educating for Zionism or educating for activism? Do we have Zionists that we're raising or activists? Before I give you a taste of that conversation, I want to uh, zoom out for a second. We were gathered there because it was the World Union of Progressive Judaism Conference. The World Union is chaired by our member, Carol Sterling, who follows the footsteps of Lily Montague, Rabbi Leo Beck, Rabbi Maurice Eisendraff, Austin Butel, her and the present Danny Friedlander, and many others had gathered with learners and leaders from all around the world to help grow and empower the reform movement in Israel and around the world, in East Asia, South America, in Europe, new congregations just starting in Italy, in Barcelona. Just a note, when you travel to anywhere in the world, please know that there is a congregation waiting for you there, and most likely a Reformed Jewish congregation while waiting for you there. All you have to do is <laughs> Google and find on the uh, World Union of Progressive Judaism website, there's a listing of all of our sister congregations all around the world. In almost any city you'd imagine, there are people who don't have as much regular contact with our community and uh, with the Jewish community as we do here and are looking to, uh, to connect with Jews from around the world. So please do look out for them when you travel. So that's why we were together. The place we were gathered is a completely different story. We were gathered at the conference where all gatherings of this type, I feel, should take place in the state of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem. And not only the who and the where, but also the, the when is important. Our conference was held on the eve of Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. The day during the Six Day War, 50 years ago, when IDF forces secured the Kotel and the city from Jordan. After the armistice following the War of Independence, access to these sites had been cut off. A border in 1948 
that was established there in negotiations with Jordan included a no man's land prohibiting access. Israelis barely even dreamt of accessing, let alone controlling, holy sites such as Rachel's tomb, the Kotel, the Western Wall. And the city of Jerusalem was built out to the west. The Knesset, the Supreme Court, the Israel Museum, all built out with Jewish West Jerusalem to the west of the old city. Sites at the border, at the gate to the city, were practically given away to organizations who wanted them, with snipers occasionally taking pot shots across the border. Windows facing the old city were often very narrow. Often they kind of had a slight angle towards the city, but were uh, mostly facing towards the side and not oriented towards the old city. The old city was Jordan. This is, in fact, how our reform movement got, gained its prime real estate um, in Jerusalem, which is just outside of the old city. It was practically given away because it was so undesirable to be that close to Jordan and the old city. And when, just over 50 years ago, Jordan entered the war, suddenly, the possibility opened up. Less of a plan than a rush to secure Judaism's holy sites, we were able to secure access for the Jewish people. We acquired and then annexed a circle of land around the city of Jerusalem, building then, in the years that followed, a circle of Jewish settlement around Har Habayit, within the municipal boundary, yet over the armistice line, so that in the future when negotiations might happen, a line might be drawn on a map of where Jews live, which will include a ring around Jerusalem. Inside of that municipal line, inside of the municipality, many small Arab villages perched on hills suddenly, in name, became part of the city of Jerusalem. When we annex the land into the city, we also annex the people living on the land. Jerusalem became united. And now we celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, a day of unity in Jerusalem. Yet, we of course know that while we may have done a great job annexing land, we have not done a stellar job of annexing the people who live on that land and incorporating them into the infrastructure of the city. The roads I traveled down last week were only paved in West Jerusalem and on the east side of the city on the way to Jewish settlements. The rest were winding dirt roads up hillsides. A majority of the homes in East Jerusalem do not have municipal water hookups. This is changing in the past three years. Jerusalem has started working towards equity in the city for all of its municipal taxpayers, but it is a slow process. In the word spoken four days ago by Israeli President Reuven Rivlin, we must take urgent care of East Jerusalem. We cannot sing songs of praise for United Jerusalem, while East Jerusalem, the area where 40% of its residents live, is the poorest urban area in Israel. President Rivlin is a Zionist. Which leads us to our topic. What does it mean to be an activist versus being a Zionist? One of my professors, Professor Paul Lips, delivered a keynote at this World Union Conference. He gave parts of his story, how he came in from the Zionist youth movements in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, how he received a call in his home, rushed to meet with his youth group pals before getting on a plane and arriving in Ben-Gurion Airport just days before the Six-Day War started. He told of his experience during the war, and then his experience just 
following the war. When he arrived in Jerusalem, a Jerusalem conquered, a Jerusalem united, he went, of course, to the Western Wall. I almost said the Western Wall Plaza, for that's what it's called today. A big open space in front of the Western Wall where 450 of us prayed together, men and women together, last Thursday. But you may not know this, 50 years ago today, that plaza was still being cleared. For there was an Arab neighborhood which abutted the wall, which was just up close to the wall. People's homes where their families had lived for generations were located just feet from the Kotel, the Western Wall. And Shavuot was coming 50 years ago today, as it is coming on Tuesday night. And the Israeli government knew that hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over Israel were also going to come to Jerusalem, to the Kotel, on Shavuot, just as our people did in ancient times. And they were going to come, men and women together, in that area near the wall, just as we had in ancient times, men and women together, coming to sing and dance and celebrate. And so my professor, Paul Lips, was one of those volunteers who came and cleared the rubble, who cleared the rubble of displaced lives so that the feet of our people could return home. These actions are not what make him a Zionist. He is a Zionist because of how he reflects on his own story. He began his talk with these words. I'm not sorry for having come here, but I want to talk to you about my pain. And he ended with these words, I came to save my people. Did I, in reality, enslave us all? Paul Lips is a Zionist. Now I want to talk to you about activism, sometimes in our community called Hasbara. Recently, in our grade seven program here, which Zoe, of course, participates in, as many that are here have, we ran a program focusing on Israel with an organization called Stand With Us. Part of the program included a three-part narrative from their educational resources about Jewish history. Part one, ancient history, indigenous roots. Part two, the diaspora, suffering and persecution. And part three, Israel, our liberation. This is from their website. Over 3,000 years ago, an indigenous people developed a thriving civilization and culture in their ancestral homeland. Over time, they were conquered by a series of aggressive foreign enemies. While some of the people stayed in their cities and communities, most of them gradually scattered across Europe and the Middle East. For 1,900 years, they lived as an oppressed minority, suffering persecution, expulsions, and ultimately genocide. They barely survived, but never lost hope. They overcame. They started a liberation movement, went back home to join those who were already there, and built one of the most vibrant, diverse, inspiring nations the world has ever seen. That nation is Israel. People all over the world have been inspired by this story of resilience and hope. Israel's story, proof that if you will it, it is no dream. So much to unpack there. I've spoken before about the diaspora as suffering, Israel as liberation, narrative before, of course, we are all suffering here in Canada, just as our ancestors have always done outside the land of Israel, how they suffered during the economic growth in Eastern Europe, during the terrible years of the Golden Age of Spain. And Israel 
is liberation from all of our worries. I'm sure that's why we all have flights booked for when Shabbat goes out to make Aliyah. So, to put that all aside, I want to spend two minutes about what I think is actually the, the most offensive part of this narrative and actually challenging to us as educators and as people who care about our youth and our teens. And that is the line that over 3,000 years ago, an indigenous people developed a thriving civilization and culture in their ancestral homeland. An indigenous people, Jews, an indigenous people. Two reasons I find this painful to read. First, because it is meant to train activists and not Zionists. It is a phrase meant to lodge into the identity of our grade 7 students so that when they meet a Palestinian friend in university and that friend uses the common Palestinian narrative and brings up their own identity as an indigenous person, our children will say, that can't be true. I've learned that Jews are the indigenous people of the land. That when the Palestinian narrative that some of their ancestors had been living on the land for thousands of years and that in the mid-1800s, in the midst of European colonialism, a group of Europeans planned to move to create a state on a land already occupied. This narrative, our children will say, it can't be true because Jews, we are the indigenous people. It is meant to arm our children, to teach our children to shut down and not to have dialogue. It is meant to give our children a narrative that is not meant to work for understanding and for peace. And, also very importantly for me, this activist training is often wrong. First of all, not an important point, but just a trivia fact. Where does the idea of Zionism as colonialism come from? The Jewish thinker Jabotinsky. And what does it mean to have Jews and indigenous people? Is this our narrative? Abraham was traveling from Ur of the Chaldeans when God spoke, saying, Lech lecha ma'artzicha, go forth from your land to the place that I will show you. Wander. Go look forwards. In the Haftarah, which Zoe beautifully chanted a few minutes ago, we heard the narrative of the Jewish people and our God as a cheating wife with a husband, and we got hints of broken promises, multiple lovers, and only in the end of days is our people given respite. And in Leviticus, a few weeks ago, we read, Do not defile yourselves, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. The land was defiled, so I punished it for its sins, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. If you don't, if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were there before you. Nachmanides interprets this verse, to mean that if we do not follow the Torah, the ethics of our people, if we do not follow the way that Jews should lead lives, the way that Jews should live, the land will vomit us out as well. Let me say that in different words. If we do not seek peace and pursue it, if we do not make sure that the law applies equally to all the citizens of the land, Kager, Kezrach, then then the land will not accept us. For as our tradition teaches us, we may dwell in the land as long as we are deserving. This is the Jewish narrative. What is the difference between an activist and a Zionist? An activist is prepared for war. An activist is someone ready to fight, tooth and nail, for an inch of land, which an Israeli soldier's parent might give away in peace. An activist arms children 
to win a fight, not with tools that they understand and can call their own, but with triggers to cause explosions of hate and anger on our campuses, so that our children will feel attacked, so that our children will feel stronger in their Judaism when they feel as if they are part of a Judaism under siege. Following our service in the Ankin boardroom are set out our confirmation reflections. And I hope you will read them. Two of our confirmands wrote about their experience with Israel. And they are complex. And they are worth spending your time with. So I encourage you to pick up the reflections and read them during the Kiddush or on your way downstairs in the Ankin boardroom. To our confirmands, I hope that you will continue living a life of complexity, living a life of Torah, and living a life that is Zionist, a life that loves the land of Israel and all of its inhabitants. As my friend and colleagues were sitting in the shady spot in Liberty Bell Park in Jerusalem, on this Shabbat before Yom Yerushalayim, we were struggling with how hard it is to find Zionists as we're working to include more people, especially women in their 20s and 30s, in the leadership of our synagogues and our movement. The consensus was this. The difference between an activist and a Zionist is that a Zionist has a vision for what Israel could be like has a vision for what Israel should be like. A Zionist has an image of what Israel will be like the day after the peace. For our educators, we must work to teach towards this vision. May you, our confirmands, have a vision of a democratic Jewish vibrant state of Israel always in your hearts. May the members of our grade seven class know that the Torah is not about who got there first, but about how to build a just society. As you all age and grow, I pray that you will continue to tie us closer to our land, to our people, and to our God. And on this Shabbat, following Yom Yerushalayim, we pray still for a united Jerusalem, and we pray for peace. Shabbat shalom.